Our next designer is Dawn Goldworm, who, with her twin sister, I don't know if you've noticed them around here, but they're quite matching and quite beautiful. Uh, they run 1229, an olfactive branding agency based in Paris and New York. They, uh, Dawn is here to tell us how she designs sensorial and emotional experience through scent, not just within perfume bottles, but within retail and art spaces, hotels, restaurants, for runway collections, for luxury products. As a matter of fact, she designed the filament of fragrance in the very air you are breathing right now here in the tent. After 10 years working within what she calls the straight beauty industry, creating fragrances for Lady Gaga, Victoria Beckham, and Heidi Klum, among others, Dawn designed her own NYU graduate degree in olfactive branding, and since then she has pushed the edges of olfactive design to include original smell for paper and silk, and even for an art installation of carnivorous plants. Dawn, we are hoping you will talk about some of these and other recent projects, you are, how you approach your goal of identifying and delivering a unique fragrantial response for brands, for events, and for carnivorous plants. Thank you. Come on up, Don. Let's start, start with the design of your graduate degree at NYU. I'm very interested. How, how was that possible, and, and how did you present it to your uh, teachers there? The idea of olfactive branding is that you can look beyond the traditional or conventional ideas and touch points of how to talk to a brand or a product and create a more engaging and possibly more emotional um, and remembrance uh, with the brand or the product. The way that works is that when you smell something, the olfactive nerve stimulates the emotional cortex of your brain. And it creates what I like to call these little scent emoticons. So you have scent and emotion linked together in your olfactive memory. And in your olfactive memory, these kind of little scent memories just kind of float around. And they're intimately linked together between scent and emotion. And so the next time you engage with the brand or the product, you automatically and instinctively have the same emotion that you did the first time you smelled the brand or the product. And so the basis of the thesis is pretty much this. Um, and then we realized in researching this more and more that you could take it kind of beyond the traditional bottle, as you say, our products for skin application, and you could use it in things like design fairs, you could use it at fashion shows, you could use it in hotels and restaurants and, and subway stations, and really any part of your life where you can engage in an environment on an emotional level, which is pretty much well, everywhere. <laughs> well, subway station sounds interesting. Please let me know which station you're doing next. I want to be there. Uh, <clears throat> Could, could you uh, tell us a little bit uh, um, about how you arrive at a sense that will clearly need to bring someone, all, all these different people, to the same kind of positive response? Because if you're branding for someone, you want it to be positive a, as well as memorable. So uh, about that process a little bit, please. Well, absolutely. I mean, we only create obviously part of the emotional experience. The other part of the emotional experience, depending on if you're in a branded environment or actually touching a branded product, you still have all the other sensory um, cues in place. But from a simple olfactive branding perspective, you very much have to uh, research the market to understand how the consumer or the participant or the viewer is not going to reject the scent. Actually, the way that it's constructed is that you have to understand based on consumer products, food, baby products, sun products, anything within that market that creates a comfort level. So you can take all of those comfortable kind of nuzzling, enveloping touch points, put them in the scent, and then add something signature. And so when they enter into the scent through these comfortable uh, touch points, they're able to comfortably explore the signature that they don't understand. Because the way olfaction works is if I gave you something that you've never smelt before, you would automatically reject it. You would automatically not like it. And it's because you don't have an emotional memory of it. And so you get scared and you would say no and push it away. 
And so the way that you create this scent is there has to be a very comfortable, engaging part so that they can kind of go through and understand the signature. And it's that signature that creates the memory so that every time they smell it again and again, they have the exact same emotion. Well, how do you uh, divine to figure out that entry point where instead of them being scared, they're invited into this experience? Where do you go for that? I have to smell a lot. <laughs> um, I pretty much have to smell all important consumer products in a marketplace. Um, so like I said, all of the food items, all of the consumer products, baby products are terribly important per region, um, sun care products. Um, anything that engages you from before you're born to when you're 10 years old, because that's when your olfaction is the strongest. Your sense of smell is fully developed in your mother at 13 weeks. So when you're born, the only thing you're born with is smell and emotion. And that's really how you translate every experience you have until slowly your other senses catch up. And then when your other senses are catching up, you also formulate a vocabulary in order to speak about them, which is something you never do with your sense of smell or your emotion, which is why it's so difficult to talk about when you fall in love with someone or so difficult to talk about why you like a certain perfume or smell. But that's so interesting that you bring up love. Uh, as, in terms of this idea of Be Opens to explore sensory design, um, you, you, you might eventually get into that area, I would imagine. I mean, you already are if you're giving people positive experiences around brands. But is it, is it a flower field? Is it baking bread? Could you give us a little idea of where you go looking? You say you smell a lot. Please get more specific. Okay, so this, I had the amazing experience to go to the Poltrono Frau factory this summer in Tolentino. Um, they engaged 1229 to create a, a custom scent for their brand. And when I went into the factory, the purpose of me being there was to smell all of the materials that they use to make their furniture. And so walking in, initially I smelled the, the different dyes, the different colors, because every color different dye had a different smell, the different leathers, the different textures of the leathers, which again, like changes the smell of the leather, um, the different fillings, which you can see here. So the twine, the rubber, the beech wood, there's like a coconut leaf that they use to stuff some of the chairs. I mean, amazing smells. And what you don't realize when you buy a poltrona for a chair or a sofa or when you sit in it is you're encompassed by all of these really wonderful and really um, kind of engaging smells that are very comfortable, naturally comfortable with the smell of the leather. And so we took this kind of experience, not only of being in the factory, but sitting in one of the chairs to recreate a brand scent that has that level of comfort because you understand all of those pieces, the beechwood, the twine, even the plastic, the leather, and then we added that signature that I was talking about to make it slightly different so that when you smell it again, you know it's Poltrona Frau and not another leather chair. And that's top secret, of course. That's top secret. <laughs> and, and how about flowers and plants and air and all the natural ingredients? Are, are they always blend it into your experiential scent creation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it depends. Every, every scent that we do is different. For instance, for Design Miami, which we created, I guess, four years ago now, the brief, per se, um, was to take the electricity or the dynamicism of Miami with the strangeness of the art world or the strangeness, the, the weirdness, the texture, the, the interest of the art world. And so to get this electric feeling of Miami, which is very kind of fresh, open, vast, salty, very bright feeling of Miami, we use the lily notes. And it's a salicylate lily, so it's kind of a salty floral feeling that's very wet, very petally, very open. And we, we paired it with an anisic note, which is, kind of smells like black licorice which is a little bit weird and dark, and uh, it doesn't fit at all, but together they make this very signature smell that you smell in the tent. So a anise and, and a lily is really the basis of everything, with a bit of salt. Well, it's the basis of Design Miami. Yeah, that's what I mean. And um, do, do you have a, a favorite place that you go uh, to start as, as an artist and as a designer? What is your starting point? Well, 
the interesting thing about being a, a fragrance designer or a nose or whatever you want to call it is that we don't necessarily have a stronger sense of smell than anyone else. What we have is a, a very vast and cataloged olfactive memory. And so it's like going to you know, an old school library and picking little you know, reference book cards. And so every time I meet a brand and I engage with them and I take them through my creative process, I'm kind of pulling out these little references from my past to understand how I can put them together to create a new smell for the brand or the or the project. But this is so interesting because um, as a creative person, you've probably explored various of your senses to arrive at uh, a project or a career. Or, 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 the nose, how did you lead with your nose? Was it from childhood? No, I would love to say that it was, that I had like this long love affair with perfumery and then I just ended up here. But actually, not at all. I. Um, I interned at Avon when I was at NYU, but this was during my undergraduate years. And, uh, and then I actually left to go to Sotheby's to get a degree in art business. I, I was really intrigued by this world and thought I would kind of parlay myself into it. But in ending my year in London, the fragrance director of Avon called me back and she sent me to a perfumery school to have my nose tested. And uh, I was very nervous because what does it mean to have your nose tested? And in fact, he wasn't testing my sense of smell. Like I said, he was testing my olfactive memory to see what I could remember, take apart and put back together to build fragrances or now build scents. And, um, and he said to me, you should stay in perfumery. You, you'd be very good at it. And I said, you know, I'm not quite sure. I don't know, this seems a little bit weird to have my entire life based on my nose. Um, but I started training in the perfumery school and, and I fell in love with it. And, and if it wasn't really in your childhood um, that you understood anything about your future, now looking back at your childhood, is there any influence or is there any moment or is there any fragrance from then that keeps coming up again and again? What's interesting is that I have a very bad memory for everything else but smell. And so when I started to train my nose, I started to remember all of these experiences I had in childhood that I hadn't remembered. And I did a study recently um, with people born before 1940. The smells from their childhood are dirt and grass, very natural smells. But after 1940, the smells of our childhood are crayons, uh, Play-Doh, Crayola. They're all manufactured smells. And how amazing is that? Because it's exactly what we're doing. We're manufacturing memories based on olfaction. And so so I started to remember all of these experiences I had as a child, and they profoundly changed the way I look at designing scents for brands that are starting now, and how children or people tomorrow are going to remember these brands based on the way that they smell, almost more than anything else, because of the way that olfactive memory works, it being the largest and most powerful, acute um, kind of way into your memory and, and your emotion. And, and since those days of crayons and Play-Doh, is there another generation of smells that you're aware of and that you draw upon? Well, after the crayons and the Play-Doh and the fun part of life, um, you start to experience your, sensu your sexuality and your sensuality. It's partly based on yourself and your hygiene and, and scent becomes a very functional part of your life and that changes um, the consumer products that you use and the foods that you eat actually. And then of course you start to have lovers and, and, and love affairs based on place actually is very interesting when you start to develop scents. You, you just mentioned um, <clears throat> uh, taste and smell coming together. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Right, so 85% of what you put in your mouth, you're actually smelling, you're not tasting. Um, your tongue is responsible for the five senses, maybe six now, they might have discovered another one. Intuition. Um, <laughs> um, but it's really um, smell that helps you interpret um, food. 
Um, and so the food that we eat is very, very strongly linked to the smells that we like. Um, because you, but the interesting thing is the way that your saliva works, you can't actually smell a lot of the food you're eating until you taste it. So they're very strongly linked. They're, they're sister relationships, which is why working with food architects, I recently did um, an installation with Bompas and Par in London, and they're amazing, amazing guys. And um, we did an installation that was recreating the idea of eating in your car to take it from a very kind of basic fast food almost junk eating when you go through a drive through to a very kind of luxury, interesting experience. And so the scent we created was partly based on food, partly based on memory. It was a smoky meat note with red wine tannins, a cherry bubble gum, and a rose absolute. It was super bizarre. Delicious and, and luxurious. Um, I, I want to talk about some of your projects because I'm sure everyone's interested. Uh, for a Lady Gaga scent, for instance, are, you, are we talking dirt? Are we talking Play-Doh? How much does she come into it with her sensorial memories? What's interesting about um, working with a person that's not necessarily um, in the design world, which kind of has a similar language to perfumery, working with someone that's a musician, they have a a very different language through sound than I have through smell. Because your, your vocabulary that you use to smell is a borrowed vocabulary, in fact. Because like I was saying, as your other senses develop, you learn how to talk about them. But because your sense of smell is already fully developed, you never learn how to talk about it. Actually, the part of your brain that smells and feels is not connected to the part of your brain that processes language. And so with Lady Gaga walking in, she would kind of speak through music, and I would have to translate that into kind of a perfumery vision. And that's how we spoke to each other, which was really interesting. Um, and she wanted some very subversive ingredients, which I... Um, well, kind of talked her out of, I think. Um, but we did do something that was uh, very interesting and that fit a global marketplace, which when you speak about how to understand how to create that comfort piece, when you're doing a fragrance that hits every market in the world, you have to know what every 16-year-old finds comfortable or every 25-year-old feels comfortable. And because fine fragrance can be very faceted, um, you can kind of put all of these little pieces in and hopefully be successful. Dawn, th this picture behind us is so beautiful because it goes with your outfit and everything else. Do you have anything else you want to show us? Um, um, sure, I could show you. Let's see. So this is just, uh, as everyone is very well aware, being here, a poltrona frau. Um, and the scent, like I said, was based on all the ingredients that's actually in that couch with the leather. And then we added an eau de cologne piece because it's a very Italian brand. And, uh, and they needed that piece to represent Italy. So this is interesting. We're designing a scent for a hotel now called the Thompson Hotel Group. They have many locations around the United States. And when I go through the creative process with a, uh, with a brand, I start with the color and texture of the brand. It's very important in designing an scent. And for their texture, they said they wanted leather, like almost oiled, worn in leather, plush velvet, and mirrored surfaces. And then the colors were black and aubergine. And so what I do is I take these kind of textures and colors and I go into my olfactive memory. And I guess what I didn't mention is that I'm a synesthete. So when I smell, I automatically see color and texture. It's something that involuntarily happens. And so I kind of go backwards through these colors and textures. I look into my little olfactive library and I pull out smells that smell initially for me like velvet, leather, black, aubergine, and mirrored surfaces. But because we don't have the vocabulary to talk about smell, actually everyone translates smell through color in their mind. And so once I create this, if I gave you the smell, you would also say it smells like leather, velvet, mirrored surfaces, aubergine, and black. It's mirrored, very interesting. Mirrored surfaces, the smell mirrored. of the mirrored surfaces. Hmm, it very adds light. Uh, and and you, you already touched on this, uh, uh, my last question. Synesthesia and a, and a synesthete, that, that was so fascinating. You said you, you almost have a psychic experience. Uh, uh, please talk to that. I don't know if I'd call it psychic, but um, it's definitely strange. Intuitive. <laughs> I think the art world calls it uh, a blessing, and the, uh, the world of science calls it a disease. It's when, um, when you use one sense to understand another. 
automatically and involuntarily. And so they say maybe Beethoven was a synesthete because his sense of hearing was very bad, yet he still created all this beautiful music. Kandinsky is said to have four different types of synesthesia, which is amazing because when you look at his work, it's so emotional and it touches you on so many levels that you understand it's beyond just the colors he's using. There's something else there. And so when I smell anything, I automatically, involuntarily see colors. And that's the way I, can, I construct the sense. And that's the way I speak to the client and translate their brand identity back into an olfactive vision. Don, thank you. That, that was absolutely beautiful to listen to you. And Kandinsky, I think, might be a math and science gene for Carter, as a matter of fact. Uh, we, we should have thought of that. Um, so thank you very much, Don.